Okay, let's see. Okay, like usual, I'll get moving another minute or two, uh, yeah, maybe yeah, a couple minutes. Um, but uh, you can feel free if you've got any kind of questions now already, you can go ahead and ask if you've got anything. I'll kind of start in earnest uh, in just a couple minutes. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I posted about this in Slack, um, but when I try to run my code, it says that um, it doesn't know what the piping is. I did um library dplyr and it still didn't work and i've already done install that packages okay so where you have library dplyr is in a chunk in the markdown document higher up and are you getting this error when you're running it or when you're knitting it it, it looks like when you're knitting it right yeah so but i didn't put um the library part i didn't put it in the r mark markdown document i ah. put it in the console yeah okay yeah, so the trick is, is that the way these R Markdown documents work is that um, they actually are kind of starting up, when, when you knit a document in R Markdown, it's sort of starting up a fresh, um, what you call like an instance of R. So it sort of opens up a blank one where nothing is loaded. And so things like packages, to use them, they have to be loaded in that R Markdown document, like they're totally standalone. And so that's all it is, is it's saying, you could use it in the console, it will work, but the R Markdown can't see it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a question about one of my bar graphs. Um, so I already created a table uh, that like it does generate a table in R Markdown and then I'm trying to convert that into a data frame so I can use it in the bar graph but it's giving me this really funky looking thing where it's just one bar and like no Y axis. Okay, do you have a, if you um, post the code I can use to generate that I can take a look at it so um, you have to any code necessary to generate the data that goes into it, or you could just post the plot itself, and I could probably figure out something to jam in there and make it work. Um, but uh, if you've got, yeah. yeah, I can. I mean, my I can show. I get the table, and then am I allowed to screen share, or am I just allowed to post code? I mean, you could, code? but it'd be easier to post the code and and display. Oh, it. okay, okay. Yeah, if you throw it in the chat, it's a little easier. Okay, so this is my table. Uh, okay, great. And then this is what I'm actually putting in the bar graph, which actually might be the problem. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Okay, I see. Okay, we got them. That one's here. Okay, so first, let's see. If I run these. Okay, yep, yeah, that's fine. Uh, okay. Okay, so you got that. And then you just want to create a bar graph out of this so you, that I imagine you've got the manufacturers on the x axis. Okay. Yeah. So don't need to convert it to a data frame. It's already a data frame. It doesn't hurt, but you know, it already is. Ah, so here's what you're thinking. So this okay. is that that um, uh, the thing here, and this is a this is one of those things that over time you intuitively get a feel for, but it can be sometimes hard to explain. So here, what you mm -hmm. said is, I want to use the manufacturer table data frame here. My yeah. AES here, you're saying X on the X axis, I want the text manufacturer, and on the Y axis, the text number of flights. So what awesome. essentially is going on here is, if I do here, you'll see the text number of flights and manufacturer. Uh -huh. So this is actually just a square indicating there's one observation that occupies the value of manufacturer and number of flights at the same time. What you actually want is you want to give it the variables named to these things. Uh, and also it's going to give you an error. Yeah, here because we need to, it's got spaces in it. So I got to put some back ticks around it. And then I think, yeah, GM call should work for this. Yeah. Okay. So what's going on here is just the difference between quoted 
and unquoted variable names. When it sees the quote, it actually just interprets it literally as text and it's like, oh, you want that word on the x-axis or the y-axis, which is probably not what you want, but ggplot yeah. is not smart enough to figure it out. And so it just does what you tell it to do. Um, later on, we will show you how to use the text that way. Technically speaking, if we left these quoted, this is like too much information, but um, if we leave these things quoted here, you could say a yes string uh, I think it's a, a string. What did I mistype here? Uh, unexpected symbol one number of. Oh, okay. It really wants it in back ticks or a, a string. Even. Yeah, you could put them quoted, but even then, it would expect back ticks around it using this. We'll okay. talk. We'll talk all the way in week like six or seven why you would ever want to use this weird thing and quote them. It turns out if you're writing functions to make like plotting templates, it's useful. But for now, in most of these ggplot and dplyr things, you just know you probably don't want to use quoted um, variable names. Uh, may I ask, like, uh, how do you? Is there a way to make like make it go in descending order, like the table above? Yes, absolutely. And that's a great question. So let me show you how to do that. So the trick with that is the thing that determines the order of them. If you look at them right now on manufacturer, it goes Airbus, Airbus Industries, Barker Jack, Boeing, Cirrus, whatever, right? This looks alphabetical to us, right? Well, the thing is, is it's not actually that it that it's alphabetical that controls the order it's rather something called the levels of the factor where manufacturer is a factor variable so if i go up here to your manufacturer table right we look at this thing manufacturer here is listed as character data when it gets sent to a plot it gets turned into a factor and factors have sort of this order forced to them based on their level so what we can do is when we generate this table up here we can go ahead and make it so that this manufacturer here has a particular order to it. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, let's mutate manufacturer. It's going to be equal to, I'm gonna say FCT relevel. This is a function I'll introduce uh, in week seven or eight when we start talking about how to Oh, actually, no, I think I'm going to do some factor stuff uh, next week now that I think about it. Yeah, from week five, we're going to talk about what I'm doing here. So what we're going to say is what we want to reorder and so control the levels that we'll display in the plot is the uh, manufacturer variable. So we're going to say we're going to cr overwrite the manufacturer variable with a new version of it to which we're going to apply FCT relevel, and then we're just going to tell it the levels that we want. So if we want it in this order, well, Okay, I could manually do this by saying the first level should be Boeing, the second level should be Airbus, and so on. So if I do this, um, it would essentially put them in this order. But it occurs to me there's actually an even easier way to do this, which is called FCT reorder. I'm going to say FCT reorder by the number of flights. And I'll show you what this does. If I do that, it's now been reordered in ascending order by the number of the flights. So what I did up here is say, I'm going to factor reorder the levels of manufacturer by another column in the data. And by default, it's going to order it by their, um, the, the count you have here, if I display the table. So Boeing is 2,659. So it's going to assign that the highest level. So there's one, two, three, four, five manufacturers. So this one is getting assigned number one, two, three, four, and five. Because this one is five, it's going to be displayed last. You most likely want that to be in the reverse order, right? Like Boeing first? Um, yeah, I was wondering if it can be Boeing first. Yeah. So let me see if it has a built-in argument to do that first. Uh, yes, dot descending equals true. So how I figured that out, this is another one of those arcane things that you develop over time as you spend more time with R, is actually being able to read the garbage documentation. So what I did here is I hit question mark FCT reorder, and it brings up the health file for the function I'm using. So FCT reorder is a function for reordering factor levels by sorting along another variable, which is the exact thing we want to do. We want to order the manufacturers by another variable, which is the number of flights. So I look down here and I see FCT reorder takes a factor variable, 
manufacturer, the one we want to reorder. It takes another variable dot x, which is the variable we're going to reorder manufacturer by. By default, it does it by median. That's not too important because we're just doing individual values. But then there's an argument over here, dot desc equals false. If I look down here, it says, would you like to order in descending order? If I say false, the default, it orders it in ascending order. Phone ringing. One second. There we go. Quite chew. Not today. Uh, scam likely. They seem to call me a lot these days. Um, okay. So what's going on here is by default, it's descending equals false. What I would like is to go in ascending or, or in descending order. So we begin level one is the most common thing, which is Boeing. So I flip it over to descending equals true. To make this clear, let me break this out into multiple lines. So basically, the arguments are the factor, the column we want to order it by, and then whether it's ascending or descending order. Descending puts Boeing first. Is I run that. A, sorry, is there a package for uh, the reorder thing? Because it's telling me that my they, they can't find that function. Mm -hmm. So if you load library tidyverse instead of dplyr or ggplot, you just load tidyverse, it will load the package you want. If you want to load them manually, this is in a package called for cats. For cats is the factor uh, tidyverse factor manipulation package. It's one of the ones loaded when you do library tidyverse. So you see me up here. I just did library tidyverse. It loads dplyr, ggplot, um, and for cats and a few other packages we use a lot in this class. It's usually the easiest way to do it. Um, but technically speaking, for this particular one, I could do library tidyverse, or I could say we're going to use library dplyr. Library ggplot2 and four cats will cover probably everything I'm going to use in this lecture and they'd be okay. equivalent. It's not I like, have... yeah, what you got? Oh, no, sorry. I was just going to say I have more questions, but I'll, I'll let someone else go. Well, if there's anybody else who wants to ask something, go ahead. Otherwise, anybody else? Well, then have that. Okay, uh, so going back to the manufact table, huh? I wanted to add something like this. To, uh, hold on, let me get rid of the comment before I post the code. So I wanted to add another column where I have like airtime per mile, uh -huh. uh, but it's telling me that I don't have, let's see, it's telling me that I don't have the airtime or like it's telling me I don't have the variables that I need. Okay, so would you like to add this to the same table or where, where would you like it? Uh, the same table. Okay, so you, you most likely don't have the variable. So notice as soon as we, um, so if I go flights and select down to here, once you've done count, you've lost all the other variables in your data set except manufacturing. Okay. Oh, okay. So what count does is it essentially summarizes and just counts the number of observations for each manufacturer, you lose everything else. So if you want to do that in some way, like, are you saying that what you'd like is you'd like the count of the number of flights per manufacturer and then the airtime per mile per by manufacturer? Uh, yeah, I guess I was just having a hard time piecing like how can I have airtime per mile linked to the manufacturer. Yeah, well, it's actually easy to do. So the thing that you're going to need to do is you're going to need to figure out sort of how you want to calculate it. So um, you can think about it a few different ways. You could, um, so this is an aggregation thing. So the goal here is going to be, we want some value of airtime per mile per manufacturer. And the question is, how do we want to calculate it? You could calculate that sort of value for each individual flight and then average it across the manufacturers, or you could say sum up their entire airtime and then divide it by their entire distance, which will give you a different result probably. Um, so think about the number you actually want to calculate. So I'll give you an example here. So let's say we do it like this. Okay. If I've run just flights, destination Seattle, and then gotten down to the individual planes here, I have um, 4,000 observations where each of them is an individual plane and flight. So different planes may have done multiple flights. 
So we have sort of this interesting um, data structure. So for instance, this tail number plane right here, N594AS, maybe it flew like five flights on this route or something like that. And so we might be averaging over all of these. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, let's just calculate it flight by flight and then average for manufacturers over it. So I'm gonna say, let's calculate a airtime per mile is going to be equal to airtime divided by our distance. If I run this, I'm now gonna have a new column here, which is the airtime per mile per flight. We still have 4,000 observations. Um, okay, and so on average, it looks like, you know, they're going pretty fast. What is that they're doing about eight miles a minute or something like that? Sounds about right to me. Um, okay, so then what we want to do is let's average over the manufacturers to see kind of an idea of so on average who's playing so the fastest. Okay, so what I'm going to say here is I'm going to get rid of count manufacturer here. We're still going to count the number of observations, but I'm going to do it a different way because I got to do it at the same time as we get this other variable. So I'm going to say, let us group by manufacturer, group by manufacturer, and then we're going to use our aggregation function called summarize. So what summarize does is it's going to collapse all of the data we have that we give to it, and it's going to make us one row of data per level of whatever we've grouped by. We've grouped by manufacturer, so we're going to get one row in our data per manufacturer, which is the same thing count did, except we want more than just the count. We still, though, want that count. So I'm going to say we'll get the count by saying n is equal to n. n is a weird function. What n does is it just counts the number of rows within the current group. So this is going to get us what uh, the count vary or the count function we used before did. But now we're also going to say average airtime per mile is just going to be equal to the mean of airtime per mile. And just in case there's missing values, there, I'm going to drop the missings. Okay, if we run this. So I didn't make any errors here. We're going to get a data frame that looks a lot like what you had before. We're going to have a column for manufacturer. We have six things here because we have a missing value for planes of an unknown manufacturer. And otherwise, we've got two different Airbuses, Barker Jack, Boeing, and Cirrus here. And then we have their average airtime per mile, which is averaged over every one of the flights for each one of these manufacturers' planes. So this is something we actually do see that's sort of interesting. If you look, there's actually a substantial variation in the speed these different planes are flying at. You'll notice here that the sort of private planes like the Barker Jacks and the Cirrus are actually flying notably faster than the commercial planes, the Airbus here and the Boeings here, right? This is a substantial speed gain over that. You could theoretically calculate this as like miles per hour or whatever if you wanted, assuming it's uh, those are the units that they're in. Um, yeah. yeah. What does the NARM equals true mean? Ah, so here, let's see what happens if I remove it. Okay. If I remove that, you'll notice here that now for average airtime per mile, I've got an NA here, an NA here, here, and here. So what's going on is something that I've talked about um, and we'll talk about um, on, actually, yeah, this week, I'm gonna talk about it on Wednesday. So if you have a missing value when you try and calculate something like the mean, the standard deviation or something, a missing value sort of poisons the well. You can no longer calculate a mean if a value is missing. So R gives you an NA back. Um, what we're doing here is saying, okay, when we go and calculate that mean, I want you to ignore the missing values and just give me the mean for the non-missing values. You have to be specific about it. To do that, you say, if you see an NA value, remove it. NA.RM stands for NA missing value remove RM. So this deletes missing values before trying to calculate the mean. Does that make sense? Yep, that makes sense. Yeah. 
common argument you'll add to a lot of stuff because you'll have missing values. R makes you be explicit about it, unlike something like Stata, which just sort of drops the missings and often doesn't tell you um, because R is being good. You should be know that you're explicitly dropping missing values. You should always be, you, you don't just want missing values to disappear without you being told because you run the risk of like dropping lots of observations you didn't intend to. You should be having to manually do it. Um, and that's what we did here. Otherwise, we can do exactly the same thing we've done up to this point. So what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to reorder these. I'm going to put the renaming of manufacturer and number of flights up here. And then if we reorder this factor variable manufacturer before we arrange here, I can instead arrange on manufacturer. If I run this, oops, what did I break? Uh, ampersand after the part, or not the, the ampersand, but the um, and after that part you copied. And here, or just like two lines higher. Uh, two Get lines. Desk true. Uh, descending true. Oh, yeah, good point. Okay. Um, so what I need here is yield pipe. There we go. Oh, still not. So it's this one. Okay. So you'll notice here that I sorted by manufacturer after having reordered the factor. If I arrange on a factor variable, it sorts it by its levels, not alphabetically. So you'll see Boeing here came last because it was the one that we set to be highest value. Cirrus comes first because it had the lowest value. So you can use a range with descend or not descend on a factor variable once you've set its levels and it will arrange the data in the table according to the factor levels rather than alphabetically also. Um, so just to give you an idea, these factor variables don't just control the way your plots look, they also control how your data gets arranged because the levels of the underlying factor are what actually control its values. Technically speaking, Boeing here is the number five. It's being labeled Boeing in our table, but it's actually the level five to R. So hopefully that wasn't more confusing, but um, what's this getting upset about? Do you mind posting that code in the chat? Because I'm trying to, I think I typed something wrong and I, oh, yeah. I can't I'll paste it <laughs> I can't figure out where it is. Okay. Oh, I broke something. Ah, because it's not capitalized. There we go. That works. Plot this, make sure that still works fine. That works fine. Okay. I will copy that into chat for you. Thank you. Absolutely. Kind of butchers what it looks like in there, but it should copy and paste out just fine. Okay. Okay, did I miss anything in chat? Uh, nope. Okay. So, anybody got anything else for me? Simpler questions, I, welcome. I do. I can copy and paste my um, code into the chat. I'm, I'm having trouble with left join. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's grab that. Okay. Ah, I see. Okay. So uh, taken flights, we filtered it. So it's heading to, I assume that's Cleveland. Uh, yeah. And then select departure. Ah, okay. So what's happening here um, is if we go down and we see what happens once it gets to select departure delay, the data frame is being reduced down. So now it only has the departure delay column. So the issue here is if we want to join it to weather, we need sort of the other columns we could use to join. So what is it about weather that allows us to connect it back to the other flights? So if we look at the weather data frame, the weather data frame has a ton of columns in it, right? But the most important ones we've got here is it has the origin. The origin is the airport that the air that the particular weather recording was done at. So the weather data frame is sort of unique um, because it actually has different weather reports for all three of the different airports. So it's important that we match on that. Next, it has year, which is technically a useless column. This is all the 2013 data. But then it has the month, the day, and the hour of the day. 
So our weather uh, sort of recordings here are very specific. They go all the way down to the particular hour of each day in each month of the year. The thing is, is if we want to get the exact weather um, at a given hour of the day matched back to our flights, we have to be able to match on the airport the plane took off from and then the month, day, and hour of the flight, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So to do that, we got to have those columns. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the flight's data frame. The flight's data frame, for instance, has a month and a day, and it has a hour column over here. We're going to need um, those. Before before we keep going, how did you, how are you able, like I know how to do names, but I, I wasn't able to see like all of this that's listed. Um, like the table that you see, how, how can you do that? So what I'm doing right here is I'm literally just double clicking to highlight flights right here and hitting control enter. It's just displaying the data frame, but the built in viewer inside of a markdown doc is usually a browsable. Does that not give you the browsable like that for you? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, that's not what I see. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if you don't, then I would imagine if we go into our options, I think it's under our markdown. Um, Chosen documents section is shop a preview in window. Is it here? Uh, yeah, I think show output inline for all markdown. Do you have this box checked in your options? Um, one second. I don't remember where. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. It's in tools and then global options. Flip down to our markdown and see if you. I do have it checked off. Okay. So everything looks like that. Is there anything weird in here? Um, nope, nope, that's fine. Visual. Nope, I just hit the wrong thing. It shows up for me. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So this is the, one of the nice things about our Markdown docs is it sort of has a built-in viewer of the output like that. It's kind of nice, and I use it like this because um, it's a little easier to browse around, mostly to show folks. I, I typically work in the console a little bit more often when I'm working on my own, but. Um, okay, so what we need is we need these columns that we can join on. So I'm going to say here, yeah, we want departure delay, but we also want the month, the day, the hour, and the origin, because we need to know the airport we're coming from, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so now we have a data frame that looks like this. All of them Cleveland flights, month, day, hour, origin. Okay, now we're good to make our join. So what we're saying over here is, okay, we want to join it to the weather data. I don't need to have flights here because what we're doing is we're taking the flights data frame and we're actually piping it into this left join already. Okay, so the, the pipe here is basically saying do these calculations here, take the result of them and then set them as the first argument to left join. So the pipe is sending it. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is the things we want to join on are month, day, hour, and origin. One thing that's neat about left join, if I don't tell it anything, and I go like that, it's going to join on all the columns that have the same names between the two data frames. If I do that, it's actually going to say we're joining by month, day, hour, and origin. So that's actually what we want to join on. We could actually be specific by literally taking this right here, and saying join on those columns, and get the exact same result. If I run this, we're now going to have a slightly different data frame. We still have our 4,573 flights that we had before. The only difference now is that added on to this departure delay, we now have the temperature, dew point, humidity, wind direction, blah, 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 all that stuff for every single one of these flights. Okay. Well, now we're at where we want, right? We've got that um, flight level weather data joined up. Does that joining make sense now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what we're going to do here is you're saying here group by month. What what are you hoping to do with the group by month? Um, to look at flight delays every month. Sorry, I wrote the code yesterday and I don't remember. <laughs> That's fine. <exactly. laughs> okay. um, so oh, for the month of May. I'm sorry. I wanted to see for the month of May oh. um, what that looked like. Okay. So if we want to look just at May, the easiest thing to do here is to say filter. Uh, month is equal to five. If I do this, I'll just show you here. 
we're going to end up getting the 414 flights that went from New York to Cleveland in the month of May. Okay, so now let's pipe that in here and look at your departure delay, uh, visibility on the Y. I would rec I would. So as like a, a, a stats and methods person, I'm always like, well, I feel like the departure delay should be the result of the visibility. And so I just must put it on the X and Y axis. Um, okay, so we probably want a scatter plot. So I'm gonna do a G on point tacked onto there. Let's see what happens if I do this. Okay, makes sense to me. So what we've got here is the visibility here. I don't know exactly what are the units or anything for visibility. It looks like 10 is the maximum, zero is the minimum. Um, and it's probably a good thing that it doesn't look like there's any flights that left at exactly zero visibility. That seems like good to me. Um, and then we have a departure delay, I assume in minutes sort of going up. One thing about this is that we have a lot of clumping over here. It looks like there's a lot of observations at max visibility that are kind of all over the place. We might think of ways to like summarize or add something to us to see if there's a relationship. So this is something I did, of course, in, in lectures. I'm just going to throw on a um, random geom smooth over here. And let's see, uh, oh, what did I get upset about? Uh, 10 rows, non-funded values. OK, so it doesn't like the geom smooth on that. How much data is there? I feel like that's more than enough data to fit a um, smooth. Uh, well, fine. Every once in a while, you get a little error with a smooth if you don't have enough data around some particular uh, section of it. Might be the missing values, too. Um, so it looks like there's a, um, so to reiterate what I did way too fast there, I'm always doing that, um, is I said here, um, the GM smooth gave me an error with the low S curve. It spit out a whole bunch of gibberish that I also don't really understand. Maybe if I looked at it in detail, um, if you just want like a line of best fit through something, it's hard to go wrong with a simple regression line. So what I'm saying here is I want to draw a smooth line through my data. My method is LM. The LM function is linear regression in R. So I'm just saying go run a linear regression of um, departure delay on visibility, draw that line for me, throw the confidence interval on it. We do it down here and what we see is, this is a statistically significant but relatively modest negative relationship between departure delay and visibility, which is exactly what you'd expect. You would you'd think when all things being equal, when visibility is better, departures will be shorter. So do something like that. Um, yeah. Okay, right, thank you. Absolutely. And if anything of that didn't make sense, feel free to, to go back to it. I'm happy to get back into it. We tend to be covering a lot of stuff like really fast at all times. And so I, I'm always bouncing around in these labs and getting ahead of myself. Okay. Anybody got anything else? This is a bit of a aesthetic question, but is mm -hmm. there, like I noticed on your, um, on your lecture slides, like the tables look really nice, like they have the shadings. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if we could also do that in like um, our markdown. Mm -hmm. Technically, yes, but kind of no. Um, so the reason that mine look like that is actually because I'm uh, using, well, I mean, I'll show you. Um, so if I go into my uh, CSS for, so, okay. The way HTML documents work in Markdown, they just look like they work beautifully and they spit out exactly what you want. And the reason that they work so smoothly and easily is all of the hard work of the sort of underlying web design has been done for you. Um, now, if you want things to look in a, look very particular, you're, you're picky about how you want things to look, like me, a very picky person about just about everything. If you're picky about how it looks and you want things like the nice colored rows in your tables, um, it might involve modifying the templates that underlay these documents. So, you know, if I knit this particular document, okay, I spit out this particular document, it looks like this. It has a particular font, it has certain colors and things like that. This is not like just, it, it, this is something that somebody decided would be the default look of an R Markdown document. To change the way it looks requires either moving to a different template that has those settings done or modifying the underlying template. The way my slides have those nice alternating colors is I have built my own template 
um, underneath the hood, which is this big mess of another language called cascading style sheets that you do not want to learn probably unless you're going to go into like web design. Um, I have some code buried in here. Um, or is it? it should be TR. Uh, buried somewhere deep inside here um, is this. I have some code over here that specifically says in tables, table content for the slide class, that is the slides in my lecture slides, every even child of the slides that is every, um, like every even row of them has a purple background. So that's been manually set in a template. You could theoretically set this sort of thing manually in your R Markdown document by providing it with some CSS. I actually forget the way to do that, um, but it's kind of a pain and it's probably not worth it. Um, if you're making like your own website or something like that, you want to have a uniform theme across everything, you could do it, but it, it involves um, way more work than you'd think it would. My recommendation typically would be just to find a template that you like um, and sort of live with it. Um, but if you really want it, the way to do it is with um, modification of the underlying cascading style sheet, which is an unsatisfying answer, but it's the truth. I have a I have a quick question. So I just dropped some code into the chat, and I'm wondering if you can if you can run it, and then I have a few questions about like what's going on there. Sure. Uh, before I run that, did that unsatisfying answer answer what you wanted off of the uh, the alternating colors? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's a pain. Um, it's one of those things that I should probably just remove it on there because inevitably once per turn, somebody's like, how do you have those nice ones there? And it's honestly, it was an accident. Um, that was the default style on the slide theme that my slides are built out of, and I just never removed it because it makes it easier to see things. Um, but it turns out it's a real pain to do. I feel like somebody could just write a little pa R package um, that would tape do tables like that. It just turns out it's kind of a pain to do. Um, yeah, anyway, so here's the code that was pasted in the chat. So what you've got here is you're saying, take the flights data and then group by carriers. Within carriers, calculate uh, for each row. So within each carrier, you're gonna get a value of its departure delay, which is equal to the sum of its departure delays, arrival delays equal to the sum of arrival delays. And the total is the sum of the departure delay and the arrival delay. Um, and is okay, removed, and you're looking at the first 10 do that, we're going to see something like for each carrier, a sum departure delay, a sum arrival delay, and the total is just the difference between those. So that makes sense to me. Yeah, so my questions were, um, why is it arranged? So why is, did it arrange this way? I guess it's arranged by carrier alphabetically. Yep. Okay. Can So could you, can you left join to... Um, the airline and carrier, because that that code didn't. Work. I tried it a di bunch of different ways, and I'm wondering how if you could just do that. So, what exactly do we want to do? Just left left join it by um, airline and carrier. So you want to join to the airlines data by carrier. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I do it by default. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay, and then I want to arrange it by total and descending order. Man, that takes forever. For, like I was trying to like it took half an hour for me. Okay, thanks. That's Jeff. perfectly fine. You're new to it, right? These things it's I mean, you know, when I was first learning to do this stuff, it took me forever to do everything. So that's fine. You know, it's like, um, I've got the better part of a decade doing this stuff. So I'm going to make it look fast, but that doesn't mean that it's either intuitive or an easy thing, right? Um, yeah, no, it's fine if you, if you like, these things are just like, how do I do this when that's a bit of a struggle? Um, once you get to know them, it can be pretty fast, but it takes a long time to develop the, the sort of, you know, being able to instantly recall these different ways to do it, knowing what stuff is going to work and not work. So yeah, that's fine. Never mean to trivialize these things. It's just sort of, you know, I'm fast at it because it's my job to be very fast at this. Okay. Any other things? 
Uh, I guess for back to the manufacturing table. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, how many things can I possibly, like, when I add another column, does mm -hmm. that make, like, is there a limit as to how many columns I can add without disrupting everything else? In what way? Like, I noticed that when we add the average airtime per mile, we have to link it. Um, let's see. Uh, average. Okay, never mind. I think I'm just getting confused over like mutating stuff and I need to get used to it. Yeah, and it's like, it's, yeah, as I said, it's not intuitive. So the thing is, you could, I mean, you can make an arbitrarily large number of columns up to the memory on your computer, which would give you a tremendous amount of freedom. Um, yes, yeah, so the gist of it is by moving from count like we did before over to the group by and summarize. The group by and the summarize approach to it is a more flexible way of approaching this that allows us to calculate multiple columns simultaneously, right? So this is nice, like we can calculate this, but then we can also calculate this and then maybe a bunch of other columns if we want. Um, yeah, it's sort of, this is a more general approach, um, but you can do as many as you want and, and figure out all sorts of clever things to do. Does that answer your question? Yep. Okay, what you got Yusuf? So now it's giving me this error code, like object total is not found. So I and tried to copy what you did. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure it's exactly this code. Okay. Small, difficult to see typos are uh, usually the problem. Yeah, that that takes the motivation right out of me. It's like error code after error code for like little things. And I'm like, what is going on? The thing to do when that occurs is to see what the error message it is that's providing. So one of the things that is one of the most valuable skills that a person can learn with R is to actually decode the bizarre error messages that you get. So, so, you know, there's a million different things you could get as errors. Like, for instance, I just deleted that, like, um, parenthesis over there. If I run this, suddenly it just stops, and I have no idea why. Okay, I'm going to cancel that out. If I ran the entire thing, again, it just sort of hangs over here. This is a case where I don't even get an error message for the mistake I've made. It could be hard to track it down, but our studio usually does a pretty good job of letting you know you're missing something. And that I'm trying to think of something that would induce the error you had. Um, So honestly, you probably had an error that looked something like this. Um, you might have said something like error, failed an implicit mutate step problem, object total not found, input dot dot one is total. Um, when you see something like that, object total not found, it usually means it can't find the column you want, which means you have probably mistyped the column name or didn't create it. Usually a typo like capitals, um, something like that. But Thanks, Chuck. Yep. Yeah, one of the real important things is to just not try not to get too demoralized, but you're always going to be seeing red text in R. That's going to be your life from here on out. Just know that it's trying to convey some useful information to you. I mean, most lines of code I run are going to produce a red error message, and I've been doing this a really long time. It's just the expectation, you know. <clears throat> And over time, you kind of get used to reading them, figuring out what it is. And typically, I find that the more time I spend trying to solve this one particular problem, once I figured out like 20 minutes of trying to solve a bug, I will never make that mistake again because of trauma. You know, that's how, how you learn. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Uh, this is a trivial question, but when I like add color to my bar graph, like, is there a reason why it makes it longer? By like, it it stretches. It stretches it. Can I see? Can you give me the code? Yeah. Uh, hold on. Yeah. So, <laughs> this might just be my computer, but on mine, it 
stretches what what Let's I see what it does. So this is the black and white version. And yeah, this back in. Second. And this is the colored version. Let's see what we got. So So why, why would it, let's see, do that. Yeah, those look, honestly, yeah, everything here is exactly the same. Um, okay, right, let's see what it does. That one looks like that. So the only thing what's probably going on is the reason its size has changed is just by the addition of the legend. Um, so the the adding the legend has probably just changed its dimensions. Ah, uh, okay. I completely forgot about the legend. <laughs> yeah. It's just one of those things where you don't need the legend anyway. So, um, yeah, I can kind of dump it. Is there a way to get rid of the legend? Yeah, it's in theme. So you have two separate theme calls here. I'd actually recommend collapsing them into one um, like that, and then do legend.position equals none. And you got no uh, legend. OK, thank you. Yeah. What you got? So I have an idea of like which carriers are like the, so I'm obsessed with like these delays, you know? Yep. And so I have an idea which carriers I think from the, uh, all the code that I ran. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, since yours, um, if this is a good, so the question is, is like, um, I guess I was hoping to compare if you think it would be valuable to run some code instead of, you know, if you could tell me who you think is the most late and then we can compare, I guess. So how would I, are you asking me to calculate who is the latest and then you can see how I do it? Yeah, I can see how you did it and I can see if my way came up with the correct answer. So first of all, with all things as a measurement question is how do we define lateness, right? And so I asked myself, how would I define like lateness for a carrier? I would define lateness not as probably it's sort of like total delays or something, but I would tend to think about it in terms of its average delay because, you know, you could have it where a manufacturer or a carrier flew like 20 flights, but each of them were a month late. It will never approach the even small accumulation of lateness of a very large carrier that flies many, 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 many flights each two minutes late. I might think of this in terms of if I were to select a given carrier, I wish to select the carrier that does not have the worst delay time on average. And so I'm thinking to myself that is a, a which has the average delay time that's not so bad. So that means what I need to calculate is I need to get the average departure delay for um, by individual carriers, right? So I'm going to say here, um, I'm going to do by carrier, I'm going to say I want to get uh, get your average delay equals um, mean Archer delay. I know there's missing values, so remove missings. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so that would give me basically what I want. Let's get some names attached to that. So I'm going to say join to airlines and arrange descending uh, average delay. Oh, airlines. Okay. So I would do something like that probably. So what this would do, um, right, is it gives me the names of the 
the the ones with the worst ones. So it looks like Frontier on average has pretty bad delays and Express, Mesa. These are companies I'm not super familiar with. Then you get down to like Southwest, right? Okay, we're seeing major carriers here with relatively large delays, but you know, still an average delay of 17, you know, um, isn't too bad. Who's really good? US Airways, Hawaiian, Alaskan. Um, so pretty good for us being in a, operating out of SeaTac, assuming the departures from SeaTac mirror the departure delays from the other ones. Um, yeah, so I might do something like that. Um, yeah, that's probably how I'd approach it. You might also think about um, think about in terms of uncertainty. You know, it's like who has the largest variation in delays. There's other things like that you could think of that um, might be useful. Any variation delays would be really easy. Now you'd expect the, uh, oh, yeah, so that's kind of interesting. The highest variation in delays is Hawaiian Airlines, even though it has a low average delay. So this is the one most likely to surprise you, right? So overall, you're probably not going to get delayed. But when you do get delayed, you get delayed by a lot. You know, that's sort of interesting information, too. Fun stuff. For showing our code in the R markdown, Mm -hmm. For this assignment, do we have to show the code for loading the libraries as well, or just for the plots and tables? Ah, just the other stuff. Feel free to hide this first setup chunk. It's just kind of, you know, it doesn't tell us anything. Um, so feel free to hide it or include it, whatever is easier for you. It just doesn't matter. Okay. Did you share that? Um... Yeah, what I did down here. Yeah. Blue beans. Anything else? I have another question. Well, I think there's just a small error in my code. So I went through um, the code that we just went over at the beginning but nothing shows up when I use ggplot. There's no graph or anything. Okay, paste in what you got. Okay. Okay, let's see. So I'll grab this, I'm gonna go a chunk, paste it in. Okay, so let's break this out so I can see. K, 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 group by. So group by month isn't doing anything here. Uh, X, Y, G, M, Y, G, M, Z. Okay, I'm gonna sit down. Okay, so that's what I see produced when I run that. Um, okay. So, what is it saying for you? Um, it's just a, a blank. It just says homework three and has my name and the date. And then it's just a blank. Oh, are you you're knitting and it's not showing up? Yes, I'm ah, sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Okay, so look up in here in the chunk option and see if you have a chunk option set. What do you got that says up there in the top? Oh, it says include equals false. That's doing it. Okay. Remove that. Okay. And you're good. All right. Awesome. I've got yeah. it. Thank you. Sweet. <clears throat> so when we do message equals false, does that change something within Echo? 
because when I do message equals false, it shows the code and I have to manually go back and change echo equals false. Mm -hmm. Message equals false is its own separate thing. It suppresses messages. So you might ask, well, what's a message? Messages include things like, and I'll show you here, include things like the message that happens when we load uh, packages. So if I knit this, assuming I don't have any broken code down there that prevents it from knitting. Okay, I don't. Okay, so we see here when library tidyverse runs, it displays all this crap right here, right? We've seen this a whole bunch of times. We usually want to suppress these package loading messages. There are messages. If I say message equals false and re-knit, you're going to see the package loading messages are no longer displayed. They're not a warning. They are a message. You see how now I do library tidyverse and that message is no longer there. That's what message equals false is for. That would be if I want to display the echo equals true display the code, but I don't want that message shown. So it's very specifically for that. If you do include equals false, it does message equals false also. It just also does echo equals false and warning equals false too. Okay. Uh, oh, it might be because I got rid of the, the, the line after your R setup. In this case, it's unnecessary. Okay. Should get exactly the same result. Yeah. So message equals false just suppresses it. It still shows the code. It just suppresses the um, any messages it might produce. So also see down here like geom smooth using formula y equals at or yx. These warnings down here. If I did message equals false, it would hide this, but it would not hide this because this is instead a warning. So you can select exactly what you want to hide. So if I do this right here and I say message equals false, okay. So the thing about using geom smooth formula is gone, but it still said I removed 10 rows containing non-finite values on my smooth. If I wanted to get rid of this message, I could then say, Warning equals false. And now I've gotten rid of that message too. So this is why there's only separate settings because sometimes you want to suppress one thing but not another thing. And so there's an option to suppress them, each one of these things individually. Um, if you want to just never have those messages, you basically need message equals false and warning equals false and it will suppress pretty much all of them. Um, not always though there's a couple there's a kind of a secret type of um display too that's the raw output from cat that can uh still sneak through and then for that you need to include equals false um yeah blah 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 is that the, yeah is the echo default true or false like true, if don't, true? oh okay okay that's why i was mm -hmm. assuming that it was false and i was like why is it showing up yeah now the default to having you show everything which kind of makes sense if you think about it. Double check over here on Slack. No, nope, nothing. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Uh, let's see. So for the table of uh, the manufacturing. Table, we now have three things. Is there a way to plot that all in one graph, or can or should we do two separate bar graphs? Yeah, it depends what you want to do exactly. So, um, yeah, if you thought about some way that these should be related in some way, and you could you could plot them meaningfully, you could put them in one. I can't really think of a way you'd want to plot these in the same graph because to me, it's sort of like sort of just fundamentally different things. This one's the number yeah. of flights. Let me, if you thought about some way you could put them together. Um, one kind of hard thing about putting them together is the scale is quite different here. I mean, literally, there's two flights here, two flights here, 2,659. And so you'd have to think about how you can meaningfully put these on the same thing. I mean, honestly, they don't even show up right on a bar plot because um, yeah, you can't, can't even. even. Yeah, because the scale difference is just so large. Um, Yeah, I'd probably do two separate things with them. Or 
yeah and even and think about whether it's even worth saying anything about like these two right here right what's really kind of funny is, is this plot this thing shows you is basically only really two plane manufacturers in this data set it's boeing yeah. and airbus and so you might just combine the airbus ones together even and then ignore these little lear jets right these are just like little private um jets oh yeah so you're saying to Wait, so we can merge Airbus and Airbus Industries together? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. I'll see how to do that. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, we've joined on manufacturer and that's fine. After we finish joining on manufacturer, I'm going to say, let's modify. I'm going to say manufacturer equals else manufacturer is equal to i'm just going to replace this one i'm going to say if it's equal to airbus industries let's just make it airbus otherwise let's leave it alone okay uh, so i'll break this out into its own lines so it's a little easier to see okay so what this is saying here is okay i'm going to create a new variable because that's what mutate does. I'm going to name this new variable manufacturer. It's a variable that exists in our data set, so it's going to result in overriding it. So we're going to say manufacturer, our new variable is going to be equal to the result of one, this or this thing, depending on whether or not it passes this test. This test says if the current value of manufacturer is Airbus industry, then make manufacturer equal to Airbus. If it is any other value, make it its same original prior value. So what this does is it just changes Airbus industry to Airbus and leaves everything else alone. If we run all of our other existing code, we should now have just Airbus and Boeing and then the same two dumb little leader jets. So this is a way to just quickly change one value to something else. This is something I did in the lecture three slides with um, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I see. Here. So uh, for R, sorry, I had prior experience with Python. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a running through loops, like but just automatically, like instead of writing like for I in manufacturer, it like already does that for you. Yeah, so this is the thing about R is that R is inherently sort of vectorized. So things that you typically in other languages need to loop or iterate over all the values, R is actually running down things, um, running down vectors, the entire vector. Um, it is actually a loop in the background. It just doesn't look like it. It just looks like you're doing it simultaneously across the entire vector. Um, this is just something that's unique to the way uh, R works, uh, which makes it really good at doing operations like this. So you don't have to come up with like loops and stuff. You literally just go directly and it, it does the processing across every single element. Um, yeah, it's vector. We're going to talk about this a lot more in uh, week seven. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it's what this is actually doing, manufacturer equals equals Airbus, right, is this is generating a logical vector, but it's running through every valuable ver a value of manufacturer producing either true or false. For every place that produces a true, it's assigning Airbus. For every place that finds a false, it just returns that original value. But it is essentially going in order from the, the first element of the vector to the last element of the vector running those tests. Um, it is doing it sequentially. It's just you don't have to be explicit about programming it. Else? We have two mutate calls. Is that on purpose or can we merge them in one? Uh, we could theoretically do it up here. Um, so uh, there's no reason we'd have to do this down here. We could redo manufacturer um, up there. So I could actually say um, we could do these simultaneously. We could say, by, oh, no, we calculate number of flights down here. No, actually, we have to keep them separate. So the issue here is we've reordered manufacturer based on the number of flights, but number of flights doesn't exist until here. 
because we create it here n equals n and then chain rename it to this so we can't do this operation until we get down here we could if we wanted um like do this operation renaming airbus industries airbus down here but it'd be awkward because then we'd have to recombine those data together this order of operations is probably the most sensible way to do it we could combine them but i think it would make more awkward code than what we have now okay yeah that that makes sense yeah there's no hard and fast rules for most of these things my opinion is unless something is actually um slowing you down for performance reasons just do whatever makes the most sense in general and in, in this case sometimes it makes kind of code that just runs together almost like you're say doing kind of stream of consciousness if it works it gets the job done and it's not causing any trouble that's the correct answer um, but if it starts to get unwieldy or slow you might make it more efficient and start combining things So United and Delta fly the most distance from, from the New York, New Jersey airports? Total distance or like average distance? Total distance. Well, they fly the most flights, so it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, normally if you have a if your denominators are different, you have a lot of like big variation in the differences in the number of flights between carriers. Almost no sum metric has any meaning. It's just really just indexing the number of flights they fly. So I tend to work on like means or medians, um, so it puts them in comparable metrics. Unless what you're interested in is just who flies the most, you know, out of the airport, as in most time spent in the air or something. Anything else? If it doesn't show up on the bar graph, then should we just leave it? Or is it still like worthy to mention them? Uh, I mean, you could literally say that there's so few of them that they're not even rendering on the plot type thing. I mean, it's not like they're not there. They're just so small that there's no really area being shown. I actually kind of wonder if we did, um, so if we look at that like that, if we actually also said color equals uh, manufacturer, yeah, that'll actually give them a, a flat little line down there. So if you make a, a, a bar plot, a column plot or something like that, fill is the color that's inside the bar. Color is the outline of the bar. If you want them to still show, you can draw an outline around their near zero value and it will still show them. So you oh, could do that. Okay, cool. I have fill already. I just didn't yep. have. Uh... Yeah, normally fill alone is, is perfect. Like normally you wouldn't use color at all, but you're in a situation where a number is so small it's invisible. So what you're essentially doing with this is by adding an outline, you're artificially inflating its size to make it visible, which is fine. Okay. You know, it's just a, it's a decision though. All visualization is really about decisions you're saying this is the best way to communicate my information so you can tweak it a little bit to make it more useful i would say displaying that really thin little line at the bottom is more useful than having to be blank okay um aside from like is there a way to remove the two like remove these two from the graph but not the table the graph but not the table yeah and the way to do that would just be um so what I would do, I'd literally take a table and say, uh, filter uh, number of flights greater than two. And if you see, that will result in only Airbus and Boeing. Pipe that into your plot as its data. And now you've just got Airbus and Boeing. Wait, what did you do for filter 
Uh, for a number of flights bigger than two, what does that actually mean? Well, it's just saying, so if we start with manufacturer table, number of flights, Cirrus Design Corp and Barker Jack each have two flights. And so I just said, give me only the rows where the number of flights is greater than two. So that just gives me Airbus and Boeing because these see. ones only have two. Yeah, it's me just like being on the spot being like, well, I'm going to pick the number that is exactly enough to cut them out of my data. You could do anything you want. I mean, it's put 10, it's going to be the same result, but I just picked two because, you know, it's the first number popped to mind because it is two and it just cuts them out. And so this is, you know, for, for plots, you do all the choosing what data you want to go in and manipulation of it before you start making the plot. You just manipulate the data and then send it into the ggplot and plot it there, but just do the manipulation, you know, right ahead of time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's see. What do you got there in chat? Okay. So, okay, that's the stuff from earlier is this. Yeah. So I'm getting this um, weird error code when, um, so I tried to change that T distance label to M distance mm -hmm. and it um, gave me this error code. So I just tried to change, literally change that T to M. Yeah. And it was yeah. like, it was like, I don't like that. Did you also change this? Nope. Thanks, Chuck. That, that was it. Yeah. Thank you. But it did, the error code was like mutate, something about mutate. Should I, should I, yeah, yeah, you're nodding. Yeah, um, it, it was probably an implicit, it said something about implicit mutate. Because that's actually the um, arrange, um, arrange as actually uh, uses the mutate function under the hood. So when you get a implicit mutate cannot find M distance, that was actually a range saying it couldn't find a column named whatever that column. Um, in its implicit mutate call, because the way arrange actually works is using mutate and reordering all of your data. Um, it's actually like rewriting the data frame and reordering things. It's just the way it works, but it does it with a mutate command. So it gives you an error that looks like this. So if I change that to a T, you're going to get this error. Arrange failed at implicit mutate step problem with mutate object T distance not found input one is t distance. So what this is saying is that my input to my arrange function is t distance. This is what I gave it, but it's saying I can't find t distance. So you try to give an argument for something I don't think exists. So the important thing is seeing x object t distance is not found. If it means it can't find this thing, I attempted to say this, so it can't find this thing. So if I make it m distance, it can then find the object and I don't get an error. The error messages mean things; they're just hard to read. Yeah, I'm getting I'm I'm getting a lot of them. I'm starting to read them now. Thanks. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, and the other thing is like, read them even if they don't make sense, because in the future you'll see that same error again, and you'll remember the situation you got it previously. That's honestly how um, like I learned most of the really odd error messages you encounter a lot in R. Things like saying. Uh, um, object type closure is not subsetable, or this does this only applies to an atomic vector. And you're like, I don't understand those words, but later on you're like, well, I know when this happened to be in the past, and you'll solve the problem the same way. <clears throat> it's like learning a new language. You hear some phrase used, even if you understand the component words to it, you're like, that phrase makes no sense to me, but you understand how the people are using it, and then you too can use it yourself, and blah, blah, blah. Cool. So a uh, basic R markdown question mm -hmm. is, um, so I have all this library stuff at the top here and I have yep. echo equals false, but there's a better message equals false. Yeah. No, I'd I'm probably sorry. do include equals false for the setup junk. Okay. Include equals false for the setup stuff. But, but for yeah. um, like the default for this assignment was echo equals true. Yeah. Which means you don't have to set anything because that's the default for markdown documents. So you don't have to say anything. If you just leave every chunk option off, it's going to be echo equals true by default. Awesome. <laughs> On the bar graph, I have like um, I updated a code. So now I have like certain colors and certain uh, variables. 
Uh, I know I can change the border color by setting like color equals black, but is there a way to make the border match what was what is already like given inside the fill colors? So by default, it's going to do that. So you're saying I want to change. You want to change the fill color and the color color. Uh, let's see. So I already changed the fill color here. I can paste my yeah. existing code. Because you basically just have to do the same thing to both of them, and then it'll probably give you what you want. But if you post post it, I'll show you. Yeah. Ah, okay. I see. Okay. Let me. Do, do, I'm just going to overwrite this. Box, summer flights, fill manufacturer. Yeah, so you've got scale fill manual. Um, okay, I'm not sure if that's going to be happy with you, but let me see what it does. Okay, it's just assigning them in order. Uh, blue, red, orange, red. Yeah, I need to get rid of the yellow, but. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we'll do that. You can do the exact same thing with scale. Color manual. Boom. Ah, okay. Yep. Yeah, they're just different scales. One one is fill and the other's color. So I just do them both. Okay. I was just wondering if there was a shortcut so I don't have to input everything twice. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice if there's like a scale fill color that just did them both simultaneously. It's not an uncommon operation, but. I mean, I could technically set a variable um, that corresponds to blue, red, orange uh, uh -oh. colors and then just use them. Yeah, I guess you could do that. Yeah, you could just do it with a vector. Um, so you could essentially say, take this out here and make it be. I get the same result. That's normally the way I would usually do something like that. If I'm going to use anything twice, I just make it its own little object. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this helped me a lot, Chuck. I, um, I feel okay with like summarize, select and summarize, you know, a um, mutate is a little bit weird. Is there any like, um, like if there were like some, well, I guess I'll just keep practicing. Um, but if I have limited time, do you have advice for like, hey, focus on like these, these three things? Yeah, I mean, not really. I mean, it's like you think about it. Um, None of it's none of these things operate in isolation. It's not like there's like one or two things, and as long as you know those, you can do everything. Because you really have to to be able to perform basic sort of basic operations on your data. You really need to have um, to know how to use like all of those basic tools. So you know, select is for picking columns, filters for picking rows. You need to do, you need to know how to do both of those things. Mutate is for creating new columns. You need to know how to create new columns. Summarize is also for creating new columns. So mutate and summarize are basically the same function. The only difference is that summarize at the same time collapses down to fewer rows. Um, summarize is an aggregating version of mutate, but has exactly the same syntax. Um, they're identical. Mutate and summarize are basically identical. But you need to know how to use all those things to do sort of basic day-to-day -day operations. You know, you're always going to be using all of those things. So, um, you know, you kind of need them all. But it's not like you, you don't go and memorize everything in dplyr, right? I mean, the number of functions in like dplyr is horrific. I mean, it has, it's a large package. It has a lot of functions in it. I would say on a regular basis, I probably use about 20 of the things in here, which are probably like the most used sort of things. Most of these other things I don't have to mess with particularly often, but when I need them, it's nice to know they're there. Um, but as far as like, I'm, in this class, I'm mostly teaching and focusing on what I'd say are sort of the really core things. Like you're, you're gonna wanna use these a lot, especially in DeepLayer. And it's really select, filter, mutate, summarize, group by. Um, so you can get a lot done with those.
Alrighty, I uh, appreciate it. I will see you uh, next. I'll see you in a couple of days. Yep. Sounds good. Great. Thank you as well. I'll be taking my leave. Okay. Bye, folks. Everybody. Yes, cat. I know you're a floof.